Yeah. Amen. Who in the back? I could use a PowerPoint, but we are going to kick off at verse 7 when we move. And if you would just uh, bring that particular slide up, because that's where we'll jump in. Uh, We want to talk this morning from this issue of being called being called to be fruitful witnesses in wilderness conditions. I want to talk about that. Much of what has transpired in our worship experience this morning has pointed us to a reality that is often missed in the pageantry, the the joy, the tiffinal response, and the movement and fervor that occurs in a worship format or style that's akin to us folk. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Us people. We. We can lose some things that are critical and have everlasting, everlasting results. If we don't get serious about the purpose. And so I want to thank uh, Brother and Sister Goodwin and their young grannies. They lit the first candle and reminded us of the hope, hope that does not make us ashamed, hope. And and God is calling for all of us to be faithful, fruitful witnesses. But it's in wilderness conditions. And so as we, we move forward this morning, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, although as uh, Brother Bell, no one, no one quite does it like Brother Cornbread Bell. <laughs> Bell said, now, Pastor, I want you to know you stopped me at 12, but if you go on to 17, it really gets good. And, and I must agree with him. It, it does get awful good. Because the remaining verses that he cited uh, reminds us of our initiation into the walk of faith, the life of a believer with baptism. And so... We want to assign that to you for further reading after the benediction. But for now, we want to deal with uh, particularly verse 7, and we'll go through 12, but we're going to launch here as we think about God's call to each one of us to be fruitful, faithful witnesses in turbulent times, times of adversity, uncertainty, times of of rage and anger. Let's pray. Father, thank you 
we adore you today. You are our Emmanuel. You've never left, nor do you have plans of leaving us. We thank you that you've even gone so far as to say when this life is over, there's a prepared place for prepared people. Speak to us now that, God, we might be your agents in this world, bringing others to saving grace in the light, the knowledge, and the word of our God. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't realize how <clears throat> deep this was going to get until uh, Friday night about uh, 10.45, 11 o'clock. Uh, me and the uh, young adults in my uh, immediate sphere of influence took to uh, the uh, movie theater over there on uh, Forest Drive over by uh, uh, Sam's. And we saw this peculiar movie. And... Uh, it, it, uh, it, it caught me because the ending was such a, such a cliffhanger. You know, it just, just, just hit me because, what was the name of Britain? Hmm? Queen. Queen of. Queen and Smith. What a name. Queen and Smith. I recommend it for viewing for mature believers and those who are prayed up. Because without telling and giving away things, it dealt with what uh, <clears throat> we were told at the end of last of the previous century that uh, the problem in America is still a color line. And, and it opens up with a scene that deals with the issue, one of the issues that we are faced with in this wilderness culture called the United States of America. And it, it, it epitomizes the experience of brothers and sisters of color as we deal with brutality, as we deal with the result of racism, and we deal with the way in which so many of us are easily victimized by persons in authority, particularly law enforcement. It, it brought all of this, in terms of what John is saying, into another whole realm. Notice now, we're picking up Matthew speaking about John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus, whom Isaiah prophesied would be his forerunner to prepare the way for the Savior. And John represents in the passage every individual who has a relationship with God through an understanding that they have been set free by the Son and who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to become vessels that God can use so that those who are out of fellowship with God can gain fellowship because John is, in essence, saying to all of us as believers that we are God's 
last hope for humanity. Now, now sit with that for a minute. Think it over. <clears throat> In all that we're going through, God has designed for persons of faith, individuals who believe in him, he has designed for those who worship him and have, have, have come to a point where they can sing that beautiful song we just went through, Emmanuel, and, and let its meaning resonate to the point where our lives reflect the fact that he is with us and we are not by ourselves. Because the wilderness will always present some challenges that are life-threatening. The, the wilderness will always bring circumstances around that you know I have anything to do about and we could not avoid or circumvent or go around. Life is of such where the storms and, and, and the, the changes that happen, we don't control those things, but we've got to go through. And we can't go through them on our own. Let, let me be clear on that. There, 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 are, there are some things you will face in this life that you're going to need to know that God is with you. There, there, there are some, there are some, there are some, some activities that you did not intend, did not plan, that weren't on your, they weren't on your itinerary, but, but, but somehow, some way, all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation that has claimed your attention. And is about to alter your reality. And, 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 and I understand it. We, we, we'll understand it better when we get upstairs. But it seems to me that God specializes in putting believers in circumstances that can only be described as a wilderness experience. There are no books written. To prepare you for the wilderness. Y'all hear me? It does not matter how, how good a parent you are. And God knows a good parent always tries to prepare their children to deal with life. This reality. But, but, but the issue is there are things that you can't be prepared for. And so one has to have a vibrant, real relationship with God for themselves. Oftentimes, I, I, I love, I, I had to smile in the back as we were, we were preparing to provide and to offer an offering in song and in praise. I had to smile. I, I, every now and then I look at Sister Sylvia in the corner, and I look at Carrie on the other side, and then I listen to what Kenneth starts to play, and I start smiling because I find a worshipful experience that reminds me that there is melody, and there's joy, and there is gladness, and there's happiness. And there is peace and there is comfort in, in being able to just experience and to praise God. And I, I thank God for a spirit of praise, a spirit that's internal, that raises up the, the music can help it. And, and, and the words sometimes can articulate it, but there is a spirit in it that grabs and, and reminds us. And you, you may not have the words to speak. You may be going through it and tears may be falling from your eyes or, or anger may be on it, but there is something about that melody that's on the inside that, that, that begins to build up. And no matter what you're going through, it anchors you down to let you know that God is still, still with you. John says here, 
to the church folk. Y'all hear me? The church folk, when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. Strange, isn't it? He didn't exalt them. Wow. He didn't pat them on the back. He didn't acknowledge them as persons of position and power and prestige and privilege. He denounced them. These are the folk who were worshiping. These were the folk who hung out in church. These, these, these were your, your preachers and your, 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 your leadership. They, they come to John outside church, away from the temple. And, and they find him in this wilderness, this outdoor setting. And they come to him and he denounces them. And look, look, look at, he, he gives these, these harsh words. He he really puts them on blast. You brood of snakes. Oh, I wish I could just break down the Greek here for you. But my, my training orientation and, and, and my ethical standards won't allow me to let you know that John, bad words. He's describing these church folk, and, and he's using this, 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 this visceral, this, this, this language from deep within him, because he, he, he's looking at their hypocrisy. He's looking at them just going to church, but, but church hasn't really gotten in them. There are a whole lot of folk who are in church, but church ain't necessarily in there. Oh, glory. There are a whole lot of folks singing now, but there's no melody in their heart. Y'all hear me? We, we can go through the motions of being good church folk, but, but, but it's just a facade. It's just it's just an activity that happens on Sunday morning because we were oriented in a way where we've got to come here. And, and we don't feel right if we hadn't been here. But there ought to be something that transpires while there is fellowship going on and while there's communion of the Holy Spirit. There ought to be something that happens that, that goes deep down in one's heart and one's mind and one's soul and permeates to the point where you have something that's left over and that bleeds over when you leave. John says, who warned you? to flee the coming wrath. Everybody, I mean everybody, no one's going to be excluded. Everyone in this whole wide world that has ever breathed is going to have to stand before Don't get it twisted. Everybody has an appointment. Let me just share with you why life has become easy for me. It's become easy because I'm not worried any longer about dying. I'm more concerned about what I do as I live because I have an appointment with death. It's a time. It's a place. It's a circumstance. It's a situation. It has an hour and a second. 
that it's going to occur. I don't know when that will be. I don't know how that will happen. I don't know where it's going to happen. And I don't know who will be there when it does. But I know that I know I've got an appointment. And it was not. It was not made by me. Prove by the way you live. You see, he didn't say prove by the way you preach, Reverend. He didn't say prove by the way you pray, brothers and sisters. He didn't say prove by the way you give. John says prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your mess. Everybody, y'all hear me? Everyone, all people have an issue with sin. Oh, my God. Prove by the way you live that you have turned from the things in your life. That God has revealed to you that are not right. Don't worry about what nobody else says because people always got something to say. You know what that says? It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter how you look. No matter how you do, somebody's always got something to say. But my brothers and sisters, it's time for us to say, who cares what anybody else thinks about me? Forget all the stuff that they may bring up. And you just deal with the fact that, you know what? God knows all about me. And if you have spent some time and you've confessed to him your sins and you've asked him to forgive you, that's it. Because he's not going to ask any of us about anything else but Whew. Let me give you all a secret. Do you know why I walk through here always happy? And you know what's this? I don't know where we can go. You know what's around here. Sit down. Is it Pastor? You talking about the happy church tonight? No. I said, yeah. You want me to tell you why? I don't look for faults and problems in others. I don't spend any time at all trying to judge, trying to rectify. I don't even try to understand some of the madness that people put in my way. The only thing I'm concerned about is what really matters. What's the issue? What's the concern? What's the problem? How can I find a solution? And I want to get busy in correcting a problem if there is one. I want to be a part of the solution if it can be solved. And I'm always looking for a way to reconcile people and things together because I realize that we take ourselves too serious. And it's not about us. It's about who we represent. And if God can say, if you confess your fault, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Who am I to waste time trying to 
find hope. That's why I look at folk and I just smile. My brother-in-law said he was proud of me yesterday because when this Caucasian brother acted as if I didn't do what I did, didn't know what I know, and did not receive the service that I received. I was able to say, hold on. I didn't come in here to complain. I just need a part for my car. And I really don't care how you figure it out or don't fix it. All I want to know is can you find the part that will help my hunk of junk run? <laughs> That's all. No anger, no bitterness, no confrontation. Because you see, I realize what it is to have been washed. I know what it is to be a sinner in need of saving grace. I know what it's like to feel guilty. I know what it's like to have been judged. And I'm so glad that God has set me free. And I'm not going to spend my life backed up in a pre-Jesus. Prove by the way you live, you repent of your sin and turn to God. Oh, hey. have you really turned to God? Won't he do it? Pray. Realized that last Wednesday we were out here praising God. Thank you, Brother Wispel. We were all together celebrating. And Russia Lean said, Y'all pray for me. Thanksgiving's coming next week. And oh, I'm going up to spend time with my mama and I got to fly. And y'all pray that the plane arrives and brings me back. Talking about what's real. When I saw my sister, nobody walks through the parking lot like Russia Lee. That hat. When I saw her, I said, great day. The plane didn't crash. It landed on time. And then I said, Pastor, it was so good. There was no turbulence, no nothing. I had a good flight up. And a good flight down. Why? Because she turned to God. It doesn't make any sense to be worrying about what could and what should. Turn it over to the Lord. Leave it in his hands. And oh, I dare you, I dare you, when you find yourself in a storm, I dare you to put it in his hands and go to sleep. Russia. Go to sleep. <laughs> See, when you put it in God's hands, he will give you rest. Oh, glory, you can just sleep because now you know you've put it in the stewards, the safest hands of all. He says, repent from your stuff and turn. Turn to God. Give it to him. You remember we left last week talking about it. Give it to God. Oh, you know that popular expression now? Turn it over to Jesus and leave it there. You want to be fruitful? Do you want God to you? To bring some cantankerous, mean, angry individual who you know you can't stand in your unsanctified mind. You see that? 
exchange, I dare you to turn them over to Jesus and leave them there. He can do stuff for folk. You and I can't. Y'all hear that? Amen. We're going to celebrate communion. Because being faithful witnesses times we're living in requires remembering who you are and knowing your being able to admit it to yourself and to God and then turning all of the stuff in your life over to God and just leave it there. And then live like you know that you know that Jesus and I love you. Isn't that beautiful? Those of you who started this worship experience with us today, the praise ministry sang, I am a friend of God. Who am I that he would even be concerned and mindful of me? Can you believe it? It's amazing that he thinks of me and he listens and he hears our prayers. Oh, that's just amazing because all of us have developed a friendship with God through Jesus Christ and nothing else. And the church said, Amen. I was told it's always proper.